Medellin, Colombia, 1982, 5 a.m. I was in my room when the entire neighborhood started shaking as military trucks came looking for the houses of alleged subversives. I look, and there were 10 soldiers and a sergeant, and they had my brother. What do I do? Do I try to escape? What if they shoot me? And what about my brother? What about my family? Open the door. This is the Colombian army. This is our right. Open the door. As I came downstairs, I saw my parents and my younger siblings shaking out of fear. I took the soldiers into the house. And as they went through everything, they discovered what they consider subversive propaganda. So they took my brother and I to their military headquarters. This happened during the 80s, when the Colombian government, the army, was in an ongoing war with the many leftist guerrilla groups, the right-wing paramilitaries, and the private armies of our infamous drug lords. But this day, the army brought the war into our home. I was 22 years old, the age of many of you, and a psychology student at the Antioquia University. Because of that, they labeled me a communist, and they felt they had the right to torture me. For also, for 10 days, they deny our whereabouts. But this happened during the week of presidential elections in Colombia. So there were some international observers. They were told there is a student and his brother taken from their house, and apparently they have disappeared. So this courageous European and American human rights activists went to each one of the military headquarters, and their actions saved our lives. And like many other people, I survived torture. I continue living in Medellin, working as a therapist, and doing theater, which is what I love. That's how I was creating my life. But then, in 1987, my mentor, Hector Abad Gomez, a human rights activist and a medical doctor was killed. It was, he was the latest on a long chain of targeted killings of people I knew. So at his funeral, I decided to leave the country. I sold my parents' house, the only possession they ever had, and came to the United States of America, the last country I wanted to be. The U.S. was the evil empire, the country that supported military regimes and oppressive governments like the one in Colombia, the country that in the name of democracy invaded nations to ransack their natural resources. But it didn't take me long to figure out the enormous difference between a country's foreign policy and its citizens. It took me even less time, a few days, to fall in love with Cindy, the woman that became my, my wife. So I have escaped, I went for exile, and all of a sudden, I was rebuilding my life. I became a marriage family therapist. We bought a new home, a better home for my parents back in Colombia. And with Cindy, we started our own family in Pasadena, California. So when my son, Gabo, was born, I was the happiest I have ever been in my life. But as he was turning one year old, my youngest brother, Hernan Darío, was taken by AIDS. He was gay and a beautiful man. He loved nature. And as I witnessed his struggle with the homophobic bigotry of my society, I was inspired to study psychology. We had failed to see his gifts, to honor who he was, and now he was gone. But then, my daughter Camila blessed our lives. And a few months later, another event bowled me over. My second youngest brother, Juan Fernando, 
was kidnapped, horribly tortured, and killed by the paramilitaries. He was an activist fighting for justice and equality. And because of that, death squad took the sanctity of his life with absolute impunity. I was inundated by rage, hatred, images of revenge. But every night, as I came home from work to play with my children, we danced a lot. Looking into their faces, I saw the loving gaze. And that became an antidote to this killer breathing inside of me. Also, at that time, as a therapist, I was doing hospice. I was a midwife for people who were dying. I was there for their last breath. I was also doing uh, bereavement groups with their families and processing my own grief. But what I learned from these people at that threshold into death, in that place somewhere, what I learned from them is that when you are there, the question is not whether you were a good parent or a nice child, a loyal friend, or a correct citizen. The question seemed to be, did I live my life? Did I become myself? The innocence of my children as they came into the world and the late wisdom of the people that were living it reminded me that I was not in this world to hate or to take revenge, not even in my fantasies. But why was I here? Why had I survived and not my brothers and not so many brilliant friends, intellectuals, artists, activists? At that time, my wife Cindy and I had been working very hard to build a home for our family. We bought fixer-uppers and work fixing them. We were also trying to overcome all this tragedy. So we decided we need an adventure, and we went to India. My wife went to practice her yoga at the Iyengar Institute, or oh, something like this. <laughs> and I was given the opportunity to do theater of the oppressed workshops in secluded villages, fascinating places. Out of curiosity, we decided to go to an ashram. And there, Cindy had a spiritual awakening. She said to me, I want to end our marriage. I want to fully dedicate myself to this new spiritual path. And I saw my wife transform into a beautiful butterfly gracefully dancing into the light. And at the same time, I became a worm, digging into the darkness of my own sorrow. She ascended, and I descended. Two different ways to seek medicine for our wounds. When we came back, we divorced, but we remained good friends. And we supported each other, especially as parents. But the bubble of my life had burst into a million pieces. I had no idea who I was, nor what was my place in this world. But life goes on. So I continue doing what I love. As a therapist, I invited many of my clients to use theater and transform the ordeals and the ruptures in their lives using beauty. So I created many original plays with gang members, with people uh, dealing with AIDS and HIV, people in prison, their families. I work with recent immigrants, and I work with torture survivors. But then, 2004, a few years after the invasion of Iraq, the photographs from Abu Ghraib shook the world. Yes, I was outraged by looking at these young soldiers photographing themselves as they were torturing their prisoners. But I was more outraged by the reaction of the country, trying to justify this insane policy by blaming it in the actions of a few bad apples. I knew this was torture, 
was a consistent policy of these and many other countries. So I created a play, Nightwing, a solo performance, where I told my story of torture in Colombia and the assassination of my brother. It was also a way for me to honor his life. So somehow, I opened the torture chamber. I shared my personal nightmares, and the world seemed to come in. People seemed interested. I was starting to realize the blessing next to the wound. I was invited to universities and to conferences about torture, first in the United States and then around the world. So slowly, I was leaving my busy practice as a therapist, I spoke with Cindy and make arrangements on how to best continue taking care of our children. I sold my house, reduced my belongings to what fit in my backpack, and then I threw myself into the world. I travel mostly to war-torn zones, to work with communities affected by violence and natural disasters. I use theater to create spaces for imagination, theater as a human laboratory to explore alternatives to conflict. Listening to their stories, I also understood the big connection between theater, art, and ritual. And ritual as that place where the broken individual gets rewoven back into the fabric of their community. Ritual as the place where humanity heals. So as I work with patents in Northern Ireland and with uh, earthquake survivors in Nepal and with people polarized in societies like Ukraine, Palestine, Afghanistan, South Africa, Guatemala. But what I didn't know is that somehow I was training myself, I was preparing myself to return to my country, to Colombia. So last year, I moved back to Medellin to fully participate in the peace process. I want to show you some images. So, these are images of the world that we are now doing in Colombia. I'm part of a team that is using deep ecology, theater for reconciliation, and healing rituals as our way to accompany the work of the newly formed Truth Commission. We know that their job is almost an impossible task. So we are trying to give our little medicine to that process. We are inviting ex-combatants and their victims from all different sites and people that had participated in the conflict to dive into an experience of reconnection to ourselves, to each other, but most importantly, reconnection to the mother. We see the earth also as a victim of our wars, our raping, our violence. But the Mother Earth, this living being, is also our most ancient teacher and our most ancient healer. I feel that all the ordeals of my life have prepared me so I can hold space with Edgar that you saw there. He was a soldier. He was trying to eradicate illegal coca crops when he stepped on a landmine planted by the guerrilla. He lost his eyes. He has burns and shrapnel scars all over his body. 
He almost gave his life for the army who tortured me. And with us was also Diana, who was forced to, forcibly recruited by the paramilitaries. She was forced to abandon her five-year-old daughter and forced to participate in combat where she almost died. She died serving the same organization that killed my brother. And in that same circle of people is Javier, their nemesis, a guerrilla, a FARC guerrilla, who is now doing everything in his power to participate in the peace process. Javier told us how the love of his life was fatally wounded during an ambush by both the paramilitaries and the army. And he was forced to leave her body and bury it in order to escape alive. So I'm working with these warriors and many of their victims. And we are trying to rehumanize ourselves by telling each other stories. We're weaving the truth with the threads of our, of our own histories. And I know that by doing this with the mother, with the earth, we are understanding that our wounds are tombs of the things that had to die, that we need to let go. But in that sacred soil, our wounds can also become wombs in which we can plant the seeds of this new life that we all so much desire. I have come full circle to the place of my early wounds, but hopefully I'm bringing medicine. And I invite you to look at the world today. Everything that sustains life seems to be collapsing. And for me, that is simply a sign that the world needs you, needs all of us. It needs you to connect to your gifts and to connect to that very unique form of medicine that each one of us carry and that we brought to the world. And for some of us, that gets reawakened, mostly when bubbles burst. Muchas gracias.